Barrett Lynn Beck was born on April 18, 1972, in Racine County, Wisconsin, and went by Barry. On July 17, 1990, 18-year-old Barry was heading two hours north to Appleton for a three-day job training seminar. As she was leaving, she said goodbye to her mother, 17-year-old brother Ben, and eerily told her father Dave, Don't worry, Dad. All the people up north are good people. They had no way of knowing this would be the last time they would ever see her alive. After leaving, Barry never arrived at her destination, and her family quickly reported her missing. As investigators began tracking her movement, they learned she stopped at the Forest Mall near US-41 and State-23 in Fond du Lac and purchased cosmetics from a Walgreens store. They then found her van parked at Kmart across the street. Six weeks later, Barry's body was found in a ditch in Waupun, 18 miles from where her van was found. She had been blindfolded and strangled to death. With no leads, the case would sadly go cold for the next 25 years. In 2014, they were able to match the fingerprints recovered from her van and an item she purchased at Walgreens before she went missing to 64-year-old Dennis Brantner of Kenosha, Wisconsin. When he was arrested on March 27, 2015, authorities found an assortment of 54 illegal narcotic pills in his cowboy boot. He was then charged with murder and attempting to smuggle drugs. Brentner's first trial ended in a mistrial, and in 2018, instead of going to trial a second time, he accepted an Alford plea deal. The Alford plea allows the defendant to not admit to the crime, but agrees that the prosecution has enough evidence to obtain a conviction. Part of that plea was a charge of second-degree reckless homicide. He was then sentenced to six years in prison for the drug charge and 10 years for the murder said to be served consecutively. As of 2023, he's already served his time for the drug charge and is currently serving the remaining 10 years for the murder. Catherine Denise Ford was born on July 20th, 1968 and went by Kathy. At the age of 19, Kathy was living in Gorman, Maryland, where she worked in her parents' diner, the Old Mill Restaurant. She also had a steady boyfriend named Darvin Moon, who was a self-employed logger and amateur poker player. On February 17, 1988, Kathy was working at the diner when she received a phone call from an individual claiming to be a magistrate in Mount Storm, West Virginia. The man wanted Kathy to meet him at 3 p.m. that day at his office to discuss some checks. The only problem was the actual magistrate in the county was a female. Kathy then received a phone call from a man claiming to be an undercover officer who called with information concerning a possible investigation of her family's restaurant by the liquor licensing authorities. She then told her co-workers to check everyone's ID before selling them beer. After that, she left in her father's silver Bronco and turned south on Route 50 and then onto Bismarck Road. Unfortunately, she was never seen again. When investigators got involved, they soon learned that Kathy was having an affair with an older man named Paul Farrell. Farrell had recently become a deputy sheriff for Grant County and was not only dating Kathy Ford, but was also dating another woman named Kathy Bernard, who had two children. A few months before this, Farrell had rented and moved into a trailer off Bismarck Road. Around 8.30 p.m., seven hours after Kathy was last seen, Farrell met up with friends at a local bowling alley. When he arrived, he was told that a woman had been calling the bowling alley asking for him. When he called the number back, Kathy answered. Farrell said she was crying and wanted to see him, so the two agreed to meet in the high school parking lot. However, after arriving, he waited 20 minutes but claimed she never showed up. It was later revealed that the actual Grant County Magistrate witnessed Farrell using the public payphone outside of the Magistrate's satellite office in the Mount Storm Fire Hall on the day Kathy vanished. She even pointed him out to her assistant, saying that he was the new deputy sheriff. After using the public payphone, Farrell went into the truck bay area of the fire hall where a phone was available for public use. He remained there for a while and then left. At 10.50 a.m. the same day, Robin Tishnell received a call from a man claiming to be a West Virginia magistrate. 
He said he wanted to discuss a matter concerning someone she knew at the Mount Storm Fire Hall between 10 and 3 that day. However, she refused to leave work, and the man ended the call. Another woman by the name of Rose Bosley, who worked at the post office, had received a strange invitation that day. Since the post office was new and didn't have phone service yet, the man called Viola Knotts, an elderly woman who lived across the street from the post office, to go ask Rose to come and get her mail carrier, whose car had allegedly broken down between Bismarck and Cherry Ridge Road. That was very strange, considering the mail route would have never taken the carrier to those roads. Interestingly, Farrell worked at his parents' general store and could see people coming and going from the post office. He could also see Viola Knott's home and the diner where Kathy worked. The next day, on February 18th, Farrell ripped the carpet out of his trailer and burned it. He claimed he did this because of dark stains and dead animal odor. However, his girlfriend, Miss Bernard, had visited the trailer on the 14th and didn't recall any stains on the master bedroom carpet or any strong odors. His landlord had also been there on January 21st and didn't notice anything either. That same day, Farrell saw Kathy's boyfriend, Darvin, who said that Kathy had been seen the previous day on Bismarck Road near Farrell's trailer. Darvin also told him that smoke had been seen in the woods near the trailer. Farrell claims he felt he was being accused of something and went into the woods to investigate the source of the smoke. That's when he found her burnt-out silver Bronco less than 200 yards from his trailer. Farrell then decided to keep the Bronco's discovery a secret, and on February 29th, he made a collect call from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, to Miss Bernard and asked her to call the Ford family and pretend to be Kathy and say she was fine. He also wrote an anonymous letter to the diner claiming that Kathy had left town and wanted her parents to know she was safe. The letter read, The only crime here was we had to get rid of the old man's Bronco right away. Kathy is 19, an adult, and we had to leave fast. We came into some dangerous money, so here's some money on the Bronco. More will follow. She will call you when she feels it is safe to do so. We are heading where I can get some work. Kathy made me write so you would not worry. She had to get away from Moon, the restaurant, and certain people. We keep the money, her green bank bag, tell Moon to leave us alone. At first, he denied writing the letter, but an FBI handwriting expert later proved it came from him. Farrell said he wasn't involved in her disappearance, so why did he write the letter? According to him, he was so afraid of being arrested, he wanted the searches to stop in hopes they would not find the Bronco. He also said he was trying to slow down the investigation so his telephone calls wouldn't be discovered. However, Kathy's brother Rich and her boyfriend Darwin were determined to find her and decided to search the area where the smoke was seen. That's when they discovered the Bronco three weeks after Kathy vanished. On March 11th, the FBI searched the area but found no trace of Kathy's body or evidence proving she had ever been there. Finding the Bronco put Farrell at the top of the suspect list, and on March 19th, the FBI got a search warrant to search his trailer. Upon pulling up the newly laid carpet in the master bedroom, they found small traces of blood on the floor, as well as on the wall and ceiling. The samples were later tested and proved to be the blood of a woman, but DNA testing could not conclusively prove it belonged to Kathy. When questioned about the blood, Farrell suggested it may have been there before he moved in. Farrell was then arrested and charged with kidnapping, arson, and murder. On March 20th, police found a wristwatch near a small burn area behind Farrell's mobile home that matched a watch that Kathy's father had given her. They then looked into Farrell's past and discovered that for years, he had a habit of making prank sex phone calls. He would typically call up bookstores and libraries and get the person on the phone to read paragraphs of books containing adult content out loud. It's estimated that he made over 206 prank phone calls. This evidence was presented in court as a way for prosecutors to show that Farrell possibly had a split personality. A neighbor of Farrell's named Kim Nelson, who didn't actually know him, came forward and reported that on the day Kathy went missing, she heard banging and terrified screams for about a minute coming from his trailer, followed by a gunshot. She then saw a man leave the trailer in a light blue car, which was later identified as Farrell's. He left for about 30 minutes before returning and then left again later that afternoon. 
The next day, she saw Farrell burning something behind the trailer, which was most likely the carpet he ripped up. She didn't learn of his name until she saw his photo in the newspaper after his arrest. In the end, on February 4, 1989, almost a year after the murder, Farrell was found guilty on all charges and sentenced to a minimum of 15 years in prison. Farrell appealed his conviction, claiming there was no proof that Kathy was even dead. However, the appeal was rejected twice. If you're familiar with this case, you might have read that some of the witnesses against Farrell later recanted their testimonies and claimed that the prosecution forced them to sign false statements. However, it's believed that Farrell's family had been threatening those witnesses, which led to that. Some people in the community believe that Farrell is innocent and was framed by her boyfriend, Darwin Moon. However, the Bronco was found with the license plate removed. If Darwin was trying to frame Farrell, wouldn't he have left the license plate on so it could be identified more easily? After her disappearance, Darwin went on to play in the World Series of Poker, where he was seen wearing a Saints cap. This led to him being invited by the New Orleans Saints to their Super Bowl victory in 2010. He then passed away in 2020 due to complications from surgery. As for Farrell, he was released after serving 18 years in prison. As of 2023, Kathy has never been found and is assumed to be dead, though some still believe she ran away to start a new life. Eli Hart was born to his father, Tony Hart, and his so-called mother, Julissa Thaller. At the age of six, Eli lived in Minnesota and was described as a kind kid who always had a smile on his face. Unfortunately, his parents were going through a nasty custody dispute over Eli. In January 2021, Dakota County filed a Child Protection Services order and gave legal and physical custody of Eli to Dakota County Social Services. Once he was in the foster care system, he was sent to live with his aunt Nikita Kromberg. During this time, Tony had made numerous complaints about Thaler's drug abuse and mental health problems, but the courts ignored him. Following a recommendation by three social workers, Thaler was granted full custody of Eli. Sadly, this would turn out to be a horrific mistake. Ten days later, on May 20th, 2022, police in Orono, Minnesota, stopped Thaler's car after reports of the car being driven on the rim after one of the tires came off. Police also found the car's back window blown out. During the traffic stop, officers noticed there was blood on Thaler's hand, and inside the car was a shotgun shell and spent casing. They also noticed blood in her car, which Thaler claimed was from a tampon. Shockingly, they also noticed flesh on her, which she claimed came from a deer she had allegedly picked up from a butcher. That's when they made a horrifying discovery. There is no tire there, all right. There's what? Blood all over the car. I have a broken windshield and I'm missing a tire because some kids were shooting at my car. I had some what looks like blood in there. And it's not blood, it's deer meat. I had a big bag of, and there's a farm around here that does deer meat and hamburgers. So. Shotgun shells all over the side. Yeah. Holy We got a body. Yeah. All right, let's cover it. Yep. Inside the trunk of the car was Eli's body with a shotgun next to him. He had sadly been shot multiple times. They also found that the child's booster seat had sustained damage consistent with a shotgun blast. A witness came forward and reported seeing Thaler coming in and out of her apartment with a shotgun wrapped in a gray blanket. Thaler was then arrested for his murder. As for a motive, the prosecutors believe she killed him to either get life insurance money or due to her mental health issues that had gotten out of control during the custody battle. Thaler's boyfriend came forward and said that Thaler and Eli were arguing the night before his death because he didn't want to go to sleep. He said she was mad and left the apartment with Eli and the shotgun. When she returned the next morning, Eli was nowhere to be found. When he asked where she went, she replied, I had to go do something. In the end, Thaler was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Tony then filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Dakota County and social services employees because he had warned them about Thaler's history of drug abuse, paranoia, and hallucinations. 
He alleges they were negligent in ignoring the warnings of the family. The case will be heard by a federal court in 2024. Riley Whitelaw was born on January 20, 2005, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Riley was described as very artistic and loved to draw and paint canvases as well as play her guitar. She was a very talented artist and even won multiple school and local awards. She was a straight-A student at Air Academy High School, where she was a member of the Color Guard. She also volunteered at the Humane Society in her spare time. In 2022, 17-year-old Riley, now a senior in high school, was working part-time at a local Walgreens. It was here that things took a turn for the worse. Riley had a boyfriend, but a co-worker of hers, Joshua Johnson, didn't seem to care and kept making advances toward her, which Riley rejected. Riley's boyfriend even got a job there, but it didn't stop Johnson's jealousy. Riley had gotten to the point where she was extremely uncomfortable working with Johnson and asked to be put on a different shift. The manager agreed, but also spoke with Johnson and warned him to be more professional while at work. Unfortunately, Riley needed some extra money and requested additional hours at work. She was told that would require her to work alongside Johnson, and so out of desperation, she decided to take the extra shift. On July 11, 2022, Riley headed to the break room to start her break. An hour and a half later, when she failed to return, the manager went to check on her and stumbled on a horrific scene. Riley had been stabbed to death in the Walgreens break room in what investigators described as an extreme overkill. When investigators checked the surveillance footage, they noticed Johnson had been stacking bins in front of the security camera until they obstructed the view of the break room. They also noticed that he had taped paper over the windows in the area of the break room and hung up the restroom closed sign to keep people out. A witness later came back by the store to say that around 5.45 p.m., when she was in the store, she heard a woman screaming in the back. It didn't take investigators long to realize that 28-year-old Johnson was their prime suspect. They eventually found Johnson walking down the interstate 100 miles from where the murder occurred. He was subsequently arrested and charged with Riley's murder. His trial was then delayed twice while the defense requested two competency evaluations. In the end, he was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Riley's loved ones created a nonprofit memorial fund titled Riley Whitelaw Art Grant to help high school seniors at Air Academy High School who want to study art realize their dreams and potential. If you want to donate, you can visit RileyWhitelaw.org. Riley's mother, Courtney, says she'll be forever proud of her daughter's enthusiasm and empathy, and she's determined to ensure that legacy lives on. Susan Marie Limesan was born on January 3, 1974, in Wolf Point, Montana, and went by Susie. Susie enjoyed playing softball and loved riding horses and going to rodeos. After high school, she enrolled at Billings Business College, where she graduated in 1993. She then spent five years working at the Macomb County Nursing Home in Circle, Montana, before moving to Glendive and getting a job as a medical transcriptionist for the Glendive Medical Center. Susie would eventually marry a man named Marty Larson, and they would have two children together. However, the marriage wouldn't last, and after the divorce, Susie obtained custody of both children. At that point, Marty was basically out of Susie and the children's lives. Susie then met a man named Ted Casey, who was 14 years her senior. They married and had two daughters together. One night, while the two were out drinking at a bar, they got into a horrible argument, which ended in Ted pouring a drink on Susie and slapping her. He was then arrested for the assault. After that night, Susie moved out, taking the four kids with her, and found an apartment in town. One Friday night, April 11, 2008, Susie left her eldest two children at home and took the youngest two girls to Ted's house for the night. She then went to a local bar and had some drinks with friends. Around 11 p.m., Susie left the bar to spend time with a man named Brad Holzer. 
By the next morning, when Susie had failed to return to the apartment, her kids became worried and tried calling her, but there was no answer. So they contacted their grandparents for help. Susie's brother Rusty and his wife Valerie went to her apartment but found nothing out of place. That's when they decided to report her missing. When police got involved, they began searching around the Ponderosa apartment building where Susie lived. That's when they noticed a fresh footprint in the dust in the doorway next door to the building. The footprint was out of place because that entrance was not in use. As they continued around the building, they noticed a drag mark in the alleyway, like something heavy had recently been pulled along the ground. When authorities got in touch with Ted, he was out of town but said he would return the following day. They then tracked down Brad, the married man that Susie had been with the night before. He told investigators that he dropped her off at her apartment around 5 a.m. However, her children said she never came inside the apartment. Brad claims he picked Susie up around 11 p.m. on Friday and they drove out of town, parked in his truck near Yellowstone, and made out. After that, they drove back into Glendive and pulled into a parking spot across the street from her apartment building. He and Susie continued to talk and make out for about 20 minutes before she hopped out of the truck and headed toward the building. He claimed he saw her in his rearview mirror as he was backing out. He then drove home, which was only a few miles away. Brad said he got home around 5.30 a.m. and went straight to bed. His wife arrived closer to 6 a.m. from a date of her own and would tell the police that Brad was there and asleep, which means if he had done something to Susie, he wouldn't have had time to dispose of her body. Plus, why would he drive her back to her apartment and then assault her when he could have easily done something to her while they were out near Yellowstone? Brad's wife then told investigators about a strange call she received from a man a few months prior. He told her that Brad was having an affair with a married woman named Susan Casey. Brad then told investigators about a strange email he received from a person named Denise Johnson. The email read, How is your girlfriend? How does your wife feel? Brad and his wife were going through a divorce, and while they were both considered suspects, their stories never changed. When Ted returned the next day, he sat down with investigators. He said that the morning Susie disappeared, he got up around 5 a.m., took his girls to his brother's house, and then drove past Susie's Ponderosa apartment, which he had to drive past to get to the town hall to meet someone to do some work. Afterward, he drove out of town to a rodeo, which was planned before Susie went missing. When asked about the last time he saw Susie, he said she dropped the girls off around 7 p.m. Friday night. He then admitted to receiving a strange phone call from someone around 9 p.m., asking what he thought about his wife going out with Brad. He admitted to being upset and called Susie to confront her. However, they were separated, and Susie didn't consider it cheating and told Ted the same. A month later, Susie's body was found floating in the Yellowstone River. An autopsy determined that she had been strangled to death before being thrown into the river. When police pulled Susie's phone records, they noticed there were dozens of calls from a number no one recognized. Those calls started while she was still at the bar and then continued while she was out with Brad. They could see that Susie had answered the calls but eventually started sending them to voicemail. Investigators involved Susie's daughter, Mariah, to try and figure out the code to her mother's phone. Once they were in, they discovered that Mariah's father, Marty, was the one calling Susie and had left multiple voicemails as well. Marty lived only about three hours away in Billings, Montana. Investigators began checking surveillance footage near the apartment and noticed a suspicious van drive by on the night she went missing. They were able to trace that van back to Marty. Marty then confessed to being in town on the night she went missing. He said he was worried about Susan and drove to her apartment to check on her and the kids. He said he knocked on the door, but there was no answer, so he drove to a gas station and then back home. While Marty had been estranged from Susie and the kids, her daughter Mariah had found him on Facebook the year prior and reconnected with him. According to Marty, Susie and him had rekindled their relationship and had even made plans to get married again in Las Vegas. It seems Susie was not on the same page as Marty, though, and she had even asked her daughter how to block his number on the night he was bombarding her phone, sending all future calls from Marty directly to her voicemail. There were multiple calls from Marty every hour. 
At first, the calls were traced to Billings, and then after 1 a.m., they began pinging along the highway leading straight to Glendive. Turns out the separation and divorce between Susie and Marty wasn't exactly amicable. After she married Ted, he showed up at their home with a shotgun. He was then arrested and charged with several offenses, including shooting at Susie's home while his children were inside asleep. Susie then took out a restraining order against him. He then stopped paying child support and lost all communication with them for the next 10 years. When investigators searched his apartment, they did find a list of things that Marty and Susie needed to do to get married. They also found that the couple had already spoken with a venue and had set the marriage plans in motion. That Friday night, April 11, 2008, Susie told Marty she was going out with some friends for a few drinks. He said he was a little worried because she tended to overdo things. That's why he had been calling so much to check on her. He even admitted leaving Billings around 1.30 when he hadn't heard back from her, claiming he thought something was wrong. Cell phone records showed that he pulled in next to the Ponderosa around 4.30 a.m. and parked around the side right where the drag marks were found. Marty then admitted to standing outside her building waiting for her to return, which would explain the dusty footprint. However, he claims he never saw Brad's truck pull in, which is strange since Brad and Susie sat there for about 20 minutes making out. During the interrogation, police were searching Marty's freshly washed van and discovered a lot of blood and tissue underneath. When Marty was questioned about the blood, he claimed he hit a deer on his way back to Billings, and that's why he washed the van. However, investigators also found blood in the trunk area, but it had been contaminated with bleach. When the results came back from the blood and tissue under the van, they were, in fact, from a deer. However, the blood evidence collected from the trunk area was too degraded from the bleach. They did find hairs caught in a plastic molding of the van and were able to prove they belonged to Susie. However, it wasn't enough to prove that he was involved in her murder. After she went missing, Marty left one more voicemail that said he was happy to hear from her and was heading home. After she vanished, Marty moved to Arizona. Her two youngest children moved in with their father, Ted, while her two eldest children moved in with their uncle, Rusty, and Aunt Valerie. Sadly, Rusty would end up taking his own life before Susie's murderer was ever arrested. Then, if things couldn't get any worse, Susie's daughter, Mariah, died in a tragic car accident on May 19, 2012. That same year, Marty was finally arrested for Susie's murder. Investigators had been able to trace the strange emails and phone calls that Ted and Brad and Brad's wife received back to the computer that Marty owned. It showed that he was basically obsessed with Susie. During the trial, prosecutors alleged that Marty had witnessed Brad and Susie making out, which sent him over the edge. When she left Brad's truck, Marty confronted her, which led to an argument and him strangling her to death. He then drove her body to the Yellowstone River and threw it in. The defense tried to argue that Ted stood to benefit the most from Susie's murder by getting her life insurance policy. However, Ted never kept the money and instead used it to pay for Susie's funeral and then split the remaining funds with her four children. In the end, Marty was convicted and sentenced to 210 years in prison for the murder of Susie. 